All right, welcome everyone. Um, let's just dive right in and uh, look at the demo. So I made a notebook. This is completely, um, well, almost written in uh, uh, Rust. This uses a JavaScript component though, and uh, I still use the DOM for quite a few different things. Uh, but we have um, some Rust code here. We can compile it. Uh, this compilation actually happens on the back end because the Rust compiler doesn't quite run in WebAssembly uh, yet. I don't think they really have plans to do that. But um, yeah, so you can see the compilation. This is streamed in over um, uh, WebSockets. And then now it's running, it's loading in this bag, which is quite big, so that takes a few seconds. I haven't implemented any sort of incremental uh, viewing of, uh, of this data yet. Um, but in a moment, yeah, it should render. And now we have the same uh, screen that we saw uh, last week already, and it, uh, it works uh, pretty well. Uh, and so you can basically run arbitrary Rust code here and compile it and, uh, and get it to run. So this is just a little, uh, a little application to familiarize myself with Rust and using Rust on the back end, using Rust on the front end, uh, communicating between them and so on. So that's uh, that's pretty fun. Um, so most of this video, I want to talk about um, how my vision has developed this week, what I've learned. So this is really how I think uh, we should be building applications that are uh, performance intensive, right? And this notebook is kind of one application uh, but in the past, I've worked on tools like WebVis, which is a very uh, heavy application. And I think tools like that should be built uh, in this way, right? So we should have like a fast language. Um, I quite like Rust so far. Uh, there's definitely some some downsides to it, but overall, it seems like a, a very nice improvement over C++. You know, if there's some reason that we can't use that, then C++, I guess, is also okay. And in previous videos, I... I talked about more experimental languages. Um, I don't think I want to pursue that too much right now because it's there's, <laughs> there's already a lot to be done, even if you choose a um, uh, more mature language. Um, but uh, you know, still keeping that in the back of my mind if, uh, if we can ever do that. And then a lot of the actual rendering should happen on the GPU, right? So we want to use shaders uh, for that. And ideally, you want to compile all of this stuff to WebAssembly and native, right? So you would uh, have a notebook like this that runs in the browser, and that has the benefits that uh, you can easily share a URL and people can go to it without installing any software. But it's always going to be a little bit slower than running a native application. So ideally, you would want to write something like this completely in Rust and then uh, also compile it to, to Windows, to Mac, to Linux, maybe even to some mobile platforms, depending on your application. And uh, and that should be faster, right? Uh, and you should have like some cross-platform APIs to abstract over all the differences. And especially the differences between WebAssembly and the native platforms are pretty, pretty large. So you definitely need a good abstraction there. And... You don't want to use the DOM or other browser features, right? Like otherwise you're not going to get an like, well, you could still get some performance benefits from running it uh, natively. Um, so maybe it's still on the table, but ideally uh, it would be way faster when you run it natively. So you would build everything with Rust and your shaders um, and then directly um, run it on the GPU instead of uh, yeah, with the latest DirectX or Metal or whatever it is. And so that is that is the vision, right? Uh, like super fast applications that run uh, completely in like a, uh, a 3D context like WebGL or DirectX or whatever. And that are very fast when you run them natively and a little bit slower when you run them on the web. Uh, and there basically seems no one, no one who's doing this, right? So uh, except for MakePad, and I already mentioned MakePad, I think in my first video, uh, I took a closer look this week, um, and I'm very impressed by what they've achieved. I've talked to the 
uh, to the founders uh, quite a bit at this point. And so I want to give my perspective on MakePad, what I've learned so far, maybe talk about some potential alternatives and then do a bit of a deep dive into what uh, what they've built because it's really, really cool. So, you know, for this this vision, they they completely share this vision. I think this is, uh, this is how they want to build uh, stuff as well. Um, and so, yeah, should I be using MakePad for, for my f- further uh, development and research? I think the pros currently of MakePad is it exactly matches my vision. They are really focused on speed. Um, yeah, it's like, seems, seems like the number one priority. Uh, it's actively being worked on. Uh, two people full time. Uh, it seems really well built. There's some some clever things in there, uh, and they are aiming for their first real release by the end of this year, right? So I talked to them. That is their goal. Um, we'll see. We'll see uh, if if they make it. But uh, you know, they're they're focused on shipping right now, and most of it is open source. So they have uh, the entire uh, library that you can can use to build applications like what I'm building here. Uh, that is open source, and then they have uh, their own editor, and their editor is uh, is also in part open source. But I think uh, they're also going to have sort of a proprietary version of that that might include things like collaborative editing and uh, stuff like that. Uh, so they 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 have like a I think a, a pretty a pretty good business model there, where uh, yeah you would build your application using their proprietary editor you would pay a bit for that but if but you don't have to right you can also choose to not use it and then you can use it all for free and you won't have any dependencies in your in your code uh, on proprietary code right like the library uh, would be completely open source so you don't have to worry that the company goes out of business and then you can't use their uh, uh, their library anymore so, uh, the, so yeah, so I think it's it's a really solid plan what they have. Um, really, really clever people. Um, and um, uh, there are a, a couple of downsides uh, for using it right now, right? So they don't have any users yet, as far as I can tell. Uh, no serious applications built on it, except for their own application. Um, I worry that they might be trying to do a bit too much, right? They seem like... A little bit not completely focused all the time, right? Like they have like the collaborative editor, they have the live compiler, they have VR, and they are saying like, okay, you know, you need to build a lot of these things relatively early on because it really informs your design. And if you lock it in too early, then um, then it might, uh, you know, you might have to completely rewrite it later and then lots of people depend on it already, which, you know, they're, they're, they're fair arguments. Um, but I think you could ship something that doesn't have all of these things and start getting users and feedback from the community and then at some point just release something that has breaking changes. But I can also see their point of view, right? Like they they can really, um, they don't have to worry about users at all right now and they kind of know what they want to build. And so it's it's a trade-off, but uh, it worries me just a little bit. And then they've worked on it for a long time already, and it's still pretty immature. So, you know, they're focused on um, releasing soon. But right now, right, like if you want to use it right now, uh, their code has no tests, as far as I can tell, maybe, or maybe a few. Um, there's no no real documentation. Uh, when I tried the examples, they didn't work out of the box and, and so on, right? Like, So it's it's definitely in a very rough state. But that, that's to be expected, right? Like they, they acknowledge this and they're saying, okay, you know, by the end of this year, they, uh, they'll, they'll have something that, uh, that people can actually start using that will have some of those problems fixed. So we're like in a little bit of an early stage. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I think, I, th- I think you can start, start using it and they, they are pretty good uh, about like talking, uh, talking to me and answering my questions and so on. So... We'll see how that goes, but I just wanted to to lay that all out there. And then, yeah, let's look at some related projects. So these are some projects that, like especially these two, have some more firepower behind it, right? Like Google has this uh, thing called Flutter. We've talked about this before. It differs from our vision in that it's a garbage collected language, but otherwise, it uh, it actually matches a few few of these things. I don't think you can do. 
Um, you, I don't think you can implement shaders directly uh, in in Flutter. I'm not not too sure about that. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, it seems like a very similar vision at least. Uh, and they are emphasizing how their garbage collector is really good and it doesn't actually sl slow things down. Not too convinced, but I haven't tried it yet, so I I, I don't know if I should uh, judge it too much. Uh, Microsoft has a project called Blazor. It's kind of like similar. It uses C Sharp. I think I might still use the DOM. I'm not entirely sure. I think Google Flutter also has a mode where you can still target the DOM, but they have, I think, a full WebGL mode as well. There's a Go variant as well. Um, and then there's some other options of what I could do besides using MakePad, right? So I could... Uh, use a Mozilla's web render. So this is kind of an interesting option. It has a very similar, like it's its rendering model is is pretty similar in many ways. Like they do sort of a single, uh, um, like they don't, like traditional um, web browser rendering engines have uh, different steps for painting, which often happens on the CPU and then compositing on the GPU. Uh, but the web render is kind of using the model from uh, games where you just do it all in one go and then mostly use the GPU. Um, and they seem to be doing something very similar, which is cool. Uh, it's a lot more mature, right? Like it's actually being used in Firefox right now. Um, there's some concerns maybe there with the recent layoffs of, uh, um, of Mozilla. I think some of the people who were working on WebRender might have been affected. But from what I can tell, they're still... There's still people actively working on it, so that's that's nice. Um, the downsides are it's very focused for using web browsers, right? So again, I don't think you can do custom shaders. Um, it's not really meant to be used in like a GUI uh, framework or so. And it's unclear to me how hard it would be to actually add that WebAssembly support. So it could be uh, potentially be done. Uh, they themselves said that there might be issues with, uh, uh, like they, they use a lot of threads, which are not super well supported in uh, WebAssembly, especially in Rust. You kind of have to jump through some hoops to uh, uh, to do that. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a manual process right now, but that, you know, if it's just threads, then we could probably overcome that. Um, there might be issues with shaders or uh, yeah, the, the shader languages that they use or library dependencies that that have other issues um, uh, yeah that, that haven't been built for for WebAssembly yet and so on so unclear uh, big question mark um, but it's 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 kind of an interesting idea and then I've also already mentioned in a previous video that we could take one of those existing uh, systems and say, okay, you know, maybe Flutter just has like a great API, is kind of battle tested uh, by a lot of users. Um, so we could do sort of a one-to-one -one port, then you don't have to think too much about how to structure the whole thing, right? Like how to, uh, how to set up the API. Uh, and you can really focus on uh, how to make it work uh, with Rust and maybe how to add support for adding your own shaders and stuff like that. So it's a lot of work though. It might not be a good fit for Rust, I don't know. I haven't looked too much into this yet, but that's another option. Okay, so now I want to look a little bit deeper at uh, at MakePad because it's, it's just really, really cool what they've done. Uh, if you're interested, I would highly recommend checking out this repo which contains a white paper from last year. Um, which seems to be a bit of a work in progress. There's some missing sections, but uh, overall it does a does a great job explaining how they think about it and how their application is structured. So yeah, the way that uh, MakePad works, like high level, you have these things called views, right? And a view um, has, has some state that is packed together, right? So it's... Um, uh, it's it's packed in a way so that you can send it directly to the GPU. So you have like uh, a big array uh, full of um, uh, full of these views. Um, as far as I can tell, they're they're just like rectangles, um, but they have an associated shader, right? So they can run arbitrary shader code. You can nest them, so you can build, for example, a button by saying like I want like a um, a sub view that is. Uh, just a rectangle maybe with some rounded corners and then another sub view that is rendered on top of it that contains the text, 
right? And um, and maybe you hook up some events to this that says, okay, if you hover over it, we give the the text and the uh, and the rectangle some different colors or so, right? So that's that's kind of how you compose them. So it's in that sense very similar to something like HTML or something, right? Where or like React, where you where you can nest your views arbitrarily as deep as you want. And then uh, there's two flows, right? And they call them immediate flow. So you have the draw flow and the draw flow uh, generates a render tree. So this basically generates a bunch of, um, uh, yeah, it, it says like, okay, we want to render this here and there and there using uh, using all these different uh, view states that we, uh, that we have. Uh, and the way that it works, it's roughly a single pass, and this makes it very fast, right? So, um, and one of the things that is interesting there is how they do layouting, right? Because oftentimes layouting is not a single pass. So if you uh, look at like uh, Flexbox um, in CSS, that's not a single pass. It's kind of a constrained model. So you have to know what your entire um, rendering looks like. You need to know sort of the um, uh, the sizes of all the things inside your your flex box, and then they run some sort of like constraint solver to say, okay, well, given all these sizes, this is how we're going to lay everything out on the screen, and that's very powerful, right? You can basically you can do a lot with that, but since they're so focused on uh, speed, they're saying like that might be overkill. Let's keep it simple. Um, and so they've come up with a system that is inspired by turtle graphics. So if you're familiar with a logo turtle, it's like this um, uh, this turtle that would uh, walk around on the screen, right? So it would like go forward and then it would rotate and then it would go forward again and you make these different shapes. And the way that they use this is you have sort of a stack of turtles. So whenever you draw a new view, you can uh, say if you want, like I want a new uh, I want to spawn a new turtle at my at the top left corner, I think, of, of my rectangle. And then as I draw uh, my uh, subviews, my children, uh, the turtle is going to move along with, uh, with this drawing. And then when you're done uh, with the turtle, uh, you can, yeah, you know the position that the turtle is now. And you can say, based on that information, I want to move some stuff. Right, so you can imagine that you can, uh, that you might want to uh, draw something and then uh, align it in the center or align it uh, vertically in the middle. And you can say, okay, we know the height of this thing now that we have drawn it, and we'll do like one final operation to to offset all of the positions that we've generated so far. And that is a very fast. So it's not entirely single pass, right? Like you you can go back and and do another pass to update those values, but it's a very fast pass. And then, yeah, this kind of works recursively or like, yeah, you can go up the stack and at every point kind of do this uh, operation. And so they, they call it turtles all the way down, right? With this stack of turtles, which is uh, which is funny. So um, that is how they do layouting and how they get sort of roughly a single pass. Um, they do quite a bit of caching of different things. So if you didn't change anything, then they know that uh, everything underneath can stay the same. And it is possible to repaint uh, without regenerating the tree, right? So you could imagine that if you have um, like a color that you want to fade out, uh, if you want to, if you need to regenerate like the entire tree or the entire subtree under that view, uh, every time the color changes a little bit during this animation, that might be a little bit expensive. So if you remember uh, the state of a view, of a view act in these large buffers, right, that are um, yeah, that is sent to the GPU directly. And so what you can do during uh, one of these animations is you say, you know, we just directly change one of these values in our view state, which maybe represents the, the current color or something as it's fading out. And then it can say just repaint, right? So it doesn't need to regenerate the tree. It already know has like the buffers associated on the GPU and all of that. And so um, or like it knows yeah which buffers need to be sent over and nothing has changed there. And so it can just do the repainting, um, which means just run the GPU on these new values, but it doesn't need to actually generate a new tree. So that is quite nice. You can do this in, anim uh, in events as well. 
yeah, and then the way that the painting works is quite simple. Um, it's back to front. Uh, it will reuse this, you know, it uses the same shader, obviously, for uh, for views that, that use the same shader. There's like some, um, some details there. I won't get into that, but... Um, yeah, overall, this seems like a very simple but powerful uh, rendering model that um, works for their application at least, right? Uh, and then they have an event flow, which is kind of in the other direction. It's front to back. So if you click on a button, uh, maybe you'll get an event first on the on the text and then maybe on the rectangle, the rectangle and then on the button itself or something like that, right? And so if they don't capture it, then you can capture it in your button. And like I said, this is very similar to the animations. You can, again, directly update your view state and repaint, or you can say, okay, you know, this view is now invalidated because we've changed something that uh, would trigger a uh, uh, a change in the, in the market as um, uh, the view as invalid, and you can... Uh, it, it would get regenerated the next on the next frame, right? That's just an event loop or like a, a render loop that uh, that renders everything. Yeah, and, and to do this, um, it has like pointers into the draw tree, so it knows oh, this is um, uh, this is like the text uh, view, for example. Okay, um, so then at at one level higher, so to speak you have passes, right? So the main pass just renders directly to the window. And so, yeah, you have like all your views, right? Like you have uh, a top level view and then underneath there, there's all sorts of other views nested and they can do the layouting with the turtles and, uh, and then um, uh, they have children again and so on and so forth. Uh, but sometimes you want to uh, have like an entirely new like 3D context or something. And so you can say, okay, uh, let's... Um, Let's uh, use a pass that uh, renders to a texture, and then the texture that we get out we'll use we'll use somewhere. So you can you can do that as well. Yeah, and then uh, the shader programming. Um, I'll actually we'll actually look at some code for this. So this is really cool, really interesting. So currently they have two models. Uh, you can either write uh, GLSL directly, uh, but they also made a custom. Rust-based uh, DSL, so it kind of looks like G GLSL a little bit, but it's actually Rust code, and I think that is to work well with their live coding, their live compilation stuff. Uh, but I didn't look too much into that uh, yet. But what I was really impressed with is uh, the API and the shaders. So you can actually do things like this, and let's let's look at some code right now, right? So this is sort of their standard library for in shaders, and you can do things like line two and move to, um, and then say, uh, you, uh, do a stroke or fill it, right? And the way that this works uses uh, uh, this technique called sign distance field. So uh, for this particular pixel, it doesn't store the entire shape, right? Like it only stores what it needs to know for this particular pixel. This is a, a fragment shader. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just really, really cool, really clever. It's actually based on uh, the work of Leonard Ritter, um, who at some point uh, published this this thing. So here you can kind of see see it in action. They modified it a little bit, I think, to be closer to the, uh, the Canvas API. But yeah, you can make these arbitrary shapes and... Um, uh, yeah, it works really well. It uh, all runs in the uh, fragment shaders. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, the text rendering. Uh, actually, let me let me see if I can find find a little example of where they they use this because I came across this somewhere, and um, I was like, this is uh, this is just really really interesting. Um, let me see if there's a nice. Uh, yeah, so maybe maybe here this is like, or like here, here we have a tab or something, right? And so it's like. It just reads as if it's uh, canvas code. So you do a rect and you fill it and then you move and you, you do a line and you do a stroke. And I think you can even do things like uh, um, glows or like uh, box shadows and stuff like that. So um, let's see if we if we can find that one. Uh, shadow, uh, what did they call it, like glow. Okay, 
yeah, I, I can't, I can't find a good example now. But anyway, it's uh, it's kind of amazing that you can just write something like this in a pixel shade in a fra yeah, um, in a fragment shader, which uh, um, but still have such an intuitive uh, uh, API. So I thought that was neat. Um, so yeah, my friend Jamie suggested that their text rendering is also very impressive. Uh, apparently, according to him, it's based on uh, on this um, uh, uh, on this technique, um, which I, I won't go into too much now, and they haven't confirmed it. But uh, it's a good read. You can type this URL into <laughs> in it yourself. I'll, 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 I'll put I'll put this link in the description of the YouTube video. Um, anyway it's really cool and then the multiple rendering backends is really really impressive too so if you just look at it right like they have bindings for metal and for direct x and like this is no joke right like this is like a serious amount of code that they made for all of these bindings uh it's just a lot of stuff and that's just the impression that i get with everything well here's a lot of stuff that's commented out but yeah still uh that's the impression that i get with a lot of this there's a lot there that they've made and they've been working on this for a long time and I think originally they built it all in JavaScript and, and now they've ported it to Rust and that took a long time but that's just a lot of knowledge captured in all of this code and it's uh, it's very impressive. Um, and like I said, there's, there's uh, things like live coding. They've already built a bunch of collaborative editing. I don't know how much of that is in the open source version uh, versus in the proprietary version. But um, in any case, there's, there's really a lot there. Um, so, um, but that's then also what, what my concern was, right? Like maybe there's too much there to really properly support uh, all of it. Um, and so they might have a rougher time, uh, yeah, rougher time there because there's just so much. Um, so anyway, we'll see how it plays out. I, I really hope, like they're they're clearly very 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 talented uh, people. So I really hope that uh, that this works out because I think this is the future of how we should be doing these kinds of things. Okay, so then for my personal next steps for next week, um, I'm thinking of porting my notebook application to use Makepad. I don't know exactly how to do everything, how to do everything yet, for example, the compilation, but they've done, you know, the live coding stuff. So maybe I can look at how they do some of that stuff. Or maybe I can, uh, um, yeah, figure something myself out, I don't know, or just build a slightly different application using, using that thing. I just want to familiarize myself with how Makepad works and, and see if it's if it is indeed a good fit like I think it is. And the alternative is um, actually trying to add some uh, WebAssembly support to Mozilla's uh, web render, like I mentioned above. I don't think this is quite the right time, but maybe, you know, things change all the time for me as I discover things. So maybe, um, maybe it would be, it would be very educational at the least. So maybe I can save that for another time, but we'll see. That's, uh, that's kind of my plan B for if, uh, if this doesn't work out, but I think I should, you know, really give this a, a good shot. So, um, I should, uh, I should probably try to figure this out next, next week, even if I run into some issues there. So that's my plan. Uh, thanks for watching and see you next time.